It is now my pleasure to hand over to the moderator of this high-level opening session, Ms. Shamika Sjermane, Director of the Division of Technology and Logistics in UNCTAD. Shamika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. A very big welcome to all of you joining from across the world to the Global Forum for NTFCs. And I call this a meeting of doers, those who walk the talk. You are the implementers, implementers of difficult institutional reforms to increase transparency and accountability of trade procedures, to ensure risk management, to reduce cost of compliance and time wasted for traders. And none of this is easy. To all that, you also need to coordinate effectively across all government agencies, the private sector, and other stakeholders, and an equally challenging task. To top it all, during the COVID-19 pandemic, trade facilitation has become essential to keep borders open and get goods flowing, especially medicines, sanitary equipment, and food. So working with over 40 national trade facilitation committees across the world and being present in over 100 countries and territories with ASICUDA, uh, our customs automation program, we have seen many good practices of uh, private public partnerships and coordination building on the relationships established through the NTFCs and we have seen countries are paying a lot more attention to information sharing and embracing digital tools. And of course, in some cases, we also saw how NTFCs went very quiet for a while during this pandemic. So this is a forum to share your experience and what worked and what did not, and then to charter the way forward for a more effective and more resilient trade facilitation environment. So let me also thank our collaborators in this endeavor, regional commissions, ESCAP and ECE with us here and the Global Alliance, the ITC, OECD, World Bank, WCO and WTO. You will hear from our partners soon. And without much ado, let me now invite the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, Isabel Durant to address the forum. Isabel, you have the floor. Thank you, Shamika. Je vais m'exprimer en français, ce qui vous donne le temps de chercher le canal pour la traduction. Et d'abord, vous saluer, mesdames et messieurs, tous les acteurs des comités de facilitation des échanges. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'introduire cet important forum. Alors, c'est vrai que la facilitation des échanges et des comités nationaux de facilitation des échanges ce ne sont pas des sujets qui habituellement font la une des médias euh, ou qui, en dehors de ces enceintes, sont très connus. Et pourtant, vos comités sont absolument indispensables et importants, y compris pour notre vie quotidienne ou celle d'un maximum de personnes. Nous avons tous ressenti les conséquences des perturbations commerciales causées par le Covid-19. Chamika vient d'en parler, pénurie de masques et d'équipements médicaux, aussi long retard de livraison pour un certain nombre de biens essentiels. Et d'ailleurs, pour certains de ces biens, les pénuries persistent, comme c'est le cas pour le bois ou les semi-conducteurs. Ou encore, nous avons connu des goulets d'étranglement qui ont entraîné une flambée des coûts du transport, déjà à la hausse en raison d'une autre flambée, celle des prix de l'énergie et des carburants. Les conséquences de ces augmentations sont rudes en matière d'accès aux biens et dans certaines régions, ça pourrait même se traduire par de l'insécurité alimentaire. Il est vrai que le personnel des frontières, des ports et des transports a travaillé dans des conditions particulièrement difficiles et restrictives pendant tous ces mois. Il est très important de le reconnaître et de l'apprécier. En parallèle, le COVID-19 a été un catalyseur pour l'automatisation et la numérisation. Une nouvelle volonté politique d'encourager la mise en œuvre des solutions automatisées et numériques est à l'œuvre partout dans de nombreux pays, avec pour objectif de faciliter et d'accélérer le commerce transfrontalier. 
mais pour que les commerçants, les commerçants puissent naviguer dans un environnement commercial en évolution rapide, la transparence et la disponibilité des informations et donc la facilitation des échanges sont essentielles. Pourtant, dans de nombreux pays, la coordination et la mise en œuvre de cette facilitation des échanges ont été relégués au second plan lorsque la pandémie s'est propagée. De nombreuses autres questions et mécanismes de coordination sont devenus à ce moment prioritaires. Et les comités nationaux de facilitation des échanges n'ont fonctionné pendant cette période que de façon plutôt sporadique. Mais dans cette phase de reprise, nous observons un nouvel élan et c'est très important. Ce n'est évidemment pas ici que je dois convaincre de la pertinence de ces comités. En outre, la plupart d'entre nous, nous savons qu'ils sont obligatoires pour les 154 membres de l'OMC qui ont ratifié l'accord de l'OMC sur la facilitation des échanges. Actuellement, les pays qui ont signé cet accord ont mis en œuvre environ 72 des obligations qu'ils prévoient. Le taux est toutefois beaucoup plus faible parmi les pays les moins avancés et pour ce groupe, le taux de mise en œuvre est à peine supérieur à 40 Environ 96 des comités de facilitation des échanges ont été créés par des lois, des lois officielles, des décrets ou des mesures de même nature. Alors, c'est vrai, il est crucial qu'un acte officiel existe, mais cela ne signifie pas pour autant que les comités sont opérationnels et fonctionnent bien. D'après notre expérience sur le terrain, trois éléments sont cruciaux pour établir des cadres nationaux durables et opérationnels. Premièrement, le rôle du comité doit être clairement défini et des plans de travail et de mise en œuvre de l'accord, ainsi que d'autres accords, doivent être absolument élaborés. Deuxième condition, le soutien politique. Le soutien politique à la mise en œuvre de l'accord est indispensable. Et troisièmement, qui dit soutien politique, dit aussi allocation de ressources. Il faut des moyens et un secrétariat pour assurer un vrai et bon fonctionnement. Depuis de nombreuses années, la CNUSET aide les pays en développement et les pays les moins avancés en leur fournissant et en construisant avec eux une assistance technique, notamment en apportant notre soutien aux comités locaux. Permettez-moi de vous donner quelques exemples du soutien que nous apportons. Par exemple, donc, nous gérons le programme d'habilitation pour les comités nationaux afin de les équiper dans leur mandat pour la mise en œuvre des réformes et pour la simplification des échanges, mais de manière coordonnée. Nous offrons des possibilités d'apprentissage en ligne et pendant la pandémie, ça a été évidemment particulièrement utile. Avec ce qu'on appelle, les francophones me pardonneront, le Trade Facilitation Reform Tracker, nous proposons un outil en ligne qui aide les comités nationaux à gérer et à suivre les activités de réforme et la collaboration entre les parties prenantes. Nous gérons également une base de données d'information sur les comités nationaux de facilitation des échanges qui permet aux différents pays d'explorer et de comparer les profils des comités entre eux, voire entre les régions. Nous fournissons aussi un programme appelé Trade Information Portals qui fournit non seulement une plateforme pour publier les règles et les procédures transparentes pour le commerce transfrontalier, mais qui aide également les pays à entreprendre leur simplification. Et enfin, comme le signalait Chamika, notre plus grand programme d'assistance technique, Sidonia, à Sicuda, est un système intégré et automatisé de gestion des douanes et du commerce. Le système assure la conformité des douanes et du commerce avec les normes internationales en ce qui concerne les procédures liées à l'importation et à l'exportation, mais aussi au transit y compris la possibilité d'établir des guichets uniques. Pour conclure, mesdames et messieurs, les comités nationaux de facilitation des échanges et les comités régionaux peuvent être d'excellents exemples de partenariats publics-privés s'ils sont bien gérés, dans le sens où le secteur public veille à la conformité, tandis que le secteur privé apporte son soutien en termes de bonnes pratiques sur les aspects opérationnels ou en soutenant la durabilité de ces comités. Il y a beaucoup à gagner à la mise en œuvre de l'accord de l'OMC sur la facilitation des échanges. Elle offre aux pays en développement et aux pays les moins avancés la possibilité de tirer parti des dispositions spéciales et différenciées de l'accord. Plus largement, les réformes peuvent améliorer la compétitivité commerciale d'un pays. 
peuvent aussi améliorer la perception des recettes, ce n'est pas rien, peuvent renforcer la gouvernance et formaliser le secteur informel. La CNUSET travaille avec de nombreux pays précisément pour atteindre ces différents objectifs. Lors de notre conférence ministérielle d'octobre dernier, les membres ont demandé à la CNUSET de redoubler d'efforts dans ce domaine. Nous sommes donc prêts à travailler avec les pays bénéficiaires, les organisations régionales et les donateurs, pour faire en sorte que la facilitation du commerce et les procédures commerciales soient adaptées pour soutenir les chaînes d'approvisionnement et de valeur de manière durable et simplifiée. C'est donc un grand plaisir de savoir que ce forum que nous n'avons créé qu'en 2017 est devenu entre-temps ce qu'il est aujourd'hui, important et crucial pour tous les acteurs. Je vous souhaite donc un forum fructueux et je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you, Isabel. I think you have highlighted the critical issues of today for uh, trade facilitation and also the priority areas where more work is needed. So you have set the stage for the rest of the forum. Thank you so much. So let me now uh, invite the Executive Secretary of the UNECE, Ms. Olga alga to, uh, to to address the forum. I think there is an issue with the uh, the video, so let me turn to um, Philip. Philip, you are with us here, and uh, to to address the uh, you know Philip Islay is the is the director of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. I mean, many of you know a public-private partnership for trade-led growth, supporting governments in developing countries to implement the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. He has 25 years of experience leading trade facilitation initiatives in almost all parts of the world. And I think, Philippe, you will, you will share with, with us your wisdom on what to do and what, to not, what not to do uh, in NTFCs. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Shamika. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> members of the <clears throat> international organizations, members of governments, uh, representatives of the private sector, dear colleagues, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. And um, it's an honor <clears throat> to have the opportunity to say a few words at the start of this topical and timely forum. I wish to thank our hosts, UNCTAD, <clears throat> for the invitation and for bringing us today to discuss the critical role of NTFCs and how to better work together through this vital trade facilitation mechanism. The title of this event, Accelerating the Implementation of Trade Facilitation Reforms Through NTFCs Despite Pandemic Situations, I would also like to add because of the pandemic situation. I say because for the reason that the pandemic has shown that when there is no other choice, trade facilitation can happen. We need to build on the momentum of the last two very difficult years to solidify some of the gains made and continue to adopt a 21st century approach to border management. Trade facilitation is actually something that we can succeed in. With relatively little investment, we can reach outsized results. I was reflecting that the last time I was addressing this group was at the UNCTAD first African Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees in Addis Abeba in November 2018. A lot has changed since then. 
But what I, what I said then still holds true today. The potential of trade facilitation across the world remains enormous, contributing to economic development and poverty reduction. Just days shy of the fifth anniversary of the entry into force of the World Trade Organization's Trade Facilitation Agreement, it's a perfect time to take stock of the status of its implementation and to ask ourselves, what are we doing right and what more should we be doing? We must not lose sight of the fact that NTFCs are vehicles for accomplishing trade reforms. Plainly speaking, they are a means to an end. They were not intended to be bureaucratic, static bodies, but rather dynamic and engaged vehicles that need to be revisited, reassessed, and further developed. <clears throat> we have seen firsthand at the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation that our projects benefit from well-functioning NTFCs. They set trade facilitation priorities, are catalysts for reform, and coordinate initiatives. Importantly, <clears throat> they are also a platform <clears throat> for trade, for public and private discussion and collaboration. We see that the NTFCs as a key partner in our projects. In many of our projects, we have created permanent technical working groups anchored to the local NTFC to ensure sustainability of our projects. As an initiative, <clears throat> we do not represent the private sector, but we act as a catalyst to ensure the private sector is incorporated into the reform process. Without the private sector, there is no trade. It is essential, therefore, that it is actively represented within the NTFCs. But just as importantly, it is essential that business recognizes this opportunity and steps up to the challenge. To business representatives in the room and in front of your screens, this is not a time to be passive. It is a time, it's the time to be part of the solution. There is a shared responsibility for trade facilitation reforms with obligations and with rewards. So let's all act as partners in this regard. With each success, big and small, that we achieve towards realizing the TFA's full potential, it will bring new far-reaching benefits. But the job is nowhere near finished. And to get there, both sectors must come together as allies to make this shared goal a reality. As part of our Alliance mission, we aim to remain practical, focused, and result-orientated in everything that we do. Our hope is that the discussions that will take place in the coming days will unfold in that spirit. Let's find pragmatic solutions. Let's learn from each other. Let's set ourselves realistic targets that can achieve in a reasonable amount of time after this forum comes to a close. I would like, I look forward, sorry, to the discussions and the ideas that we'll be generating during the next four days and wish to reaffirm the Alliance's commitment to supporting NTFCs in developing countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, you highlighted the value of a well-functioning NTFC, especially for private sector to be successful in doing international trade. And I also like the fact that you said that we should have realistic targets so that we can you know, move forward with the NTFCs. So thank you so much. I think our video systems are on now. So let's hear from the Executive Secretary of the UNECE, Ms. Olga Algayarewa. Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to open this session of the Global Forum 2022 for the National Trade Facilitation Committees on accelerating the implementation of trade facilitation reforms through the National Trade Facilitation Committees despite the pandemic. Thank you for the kind invitation extended to the UNEC. The COVID-19 pandemic has sunk the global economy into a recession. World trade has suffered immensely due to supply chain disruptions. In 2020, 
the value of merchandise exports fell by 8% while trade in services declined by 21%. Economies in transition of the UNEC region, including Central Asia, have been significantly affected by this downturn. And as micro, small and medium enterprises are more than 90% of all businesses involved, the impact on them has been severe. The social distancing measures and restrictions on movement caused by the pandemic led global trade to move rapidly to digital channels. The shift has greatly increased online retail trade. Moreover, lines of trucks, often hundreds of vehicles long, were a frequent sight at many border crossings at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Quarantining of containers at seaports and increased delays for restricted goods were also common. Reforms aimed at overcoming those logistical barriers have helped many countries improve trade flows. Trade facilitation plays a vital role in building back better from COVID-19 and increasing resilience against future emergencies. Simplification, standardization, harmonization, modernization of international cross-border trade, all of these make international trade faster and cheaper, as well as more accessible for SMEs and landlocked developing countries. It is time that we take a comprehensive view of the trade facilitation reforms that can contribute to the national sustainable development priorities of the country. We need a 360 degree view of trade facilitation, catering to the needs of the trading communities and the long-term sustainability uh, of regulatory and commercial procedures. National trade facilitation committees or NTFCs with balanced private and public sector participation are perfect platforms for institutional coordination and stakeholder consultation. They enable the planning and implementation of successful trade facilitation reforms. The establishment of NTFCs that embrace the views and opinions of all stakeholders are indispensable for pursuing agreement, cooperation and coordination. In fact, NTFCs can act as the main coordinating body for any trade facilitation reforms. Let me cite here the UN Global Survey on Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation 2021, for which we led the component for the UNEC region in cooperation with UNCTAD and other regional commissions. In our region, 37 out of 44 participating countries either fully or partially establish a National Trade Facilitation Committee. Nevertheless, Many countries, and in particular economies in transition, still struggle to make the most of NTFCs due to lack of resources, training, and connectivity. Ladies and gentlemen, UNEC stands with its member states and the global community with its normative instruments, such as trade facilitation recommendations, e-business standards, and related guidance. Our UN Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, or UNC FACT, has revised and adopted recommendation four on national trade facilitation bodies, or NTFBs, one of the, of the oldest recommendations first adopted in 1974 and most recently updated in 2015. It is available in English, French, and Russian. It integrates guidelines that provide a detailed description of the steps for establishing the NTFC as well as a model terms of reference for NTFC, which countries can use or customize based on their national context. It also provides a non-exhaustive list of stakeholders that should be represented in an NTFB. 
last year, UNICE also developed a training manual on NTFCs. It provides government authorities, traders, and related trade service providers with training materials to increase their knowledge and understanding of the key components of NTFCs and steps for establishing and effectively operating them. This includes information on the structure, governance, funding, sustainability, and membership of NTFCs. The manual provides the reader with tools that can be used to support informed policy decisions. UNEC is aware about the crucial role of international organizations in developing capacities of NTFCs, not only for implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement, but for integrating the trade facilitation agenda in national development strategies. In that context, the National Trade Facilitation Roadmap, or NTFR, is a pertinent instrument to consider. The roadmaps provide a time-bound vision with key goals and prioritized activities, taking into account other national development priorities. Recently, UNEC supported Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan to develop national trade facilitation roadmaps. Finally, I'm proud to announce that UNEC is finalizing the guide to the implementation of the Article 1.3 of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, Trade Facilitation Inquiry Points. The guide is expected to provide practical assistance to UN member states. This guide emphasizes the principle of sustainable and efficient use of resources in international trade, a principle related to the green economy. The concept of green and circular economy is of vital priority to the UNEC as decided on the 69th Commission with member states. All of these instruments are available globally and are immensely useful to those involved in the establishment of trade facilitation committees and all concerned actors, both public and private. In conclusion, I once again thank the organizers for inviting me to this event and I wish you a successful discussion and fruitful deliberations. Distinguished delegates, ladies. Thank you very much. So let's move from Europe to Asia and the Pacific. I would like to now invite the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, Ms. Armida Salcia Alice Jabana. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to join you for this opening session of the Global Forum 2022 for National Trade Facilitation Committees. With the current disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic, accelerating the implementation of trade facilitation reform is more crucial than ever to ensure that trade can play its role as a key means of implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Efficient and transparent trade procedures are essential for making trade more inclusive and minimizing the negative impacts transportation of goods across borders can have on the environment. In this time of the pandemic, the public and private sectors need to work together to ensure that essential supplies such as medicines and vaccines reach their destinations in a timely manner. Coordination among the many stakeholders involved is crucial, making national trade facilitation committees and this forum particularly relevant. ESCAP and the other UN regional commissions conduct a joint global survey on digital and sustainable trade facilitation every two years. We are pleased to present the global report summarizing the results of the 2021 survey during this forum. The results are encouraging. Countries across the globe have continued to make progress on implementing trade facilitation measures during the pandemic especially on digitalizing international trade formalities. However, challenges persist. Despite significant progress over the past two years, the implementation of cross-border paperless trade is still low. 
it is estimated that full digital trade facilitation implementation could cut uh, the average trade cost by more than 30%. This would be seven percentage point more than would be expected from simply achieving compliance with WTO TFA measures. Strong political will and closer intergovernmental cooperation are needed to further progress trade digitalization as an important element of countries' digital transformation efforts. The report also highlights the lack of implementation of sustainable trade facilitation measures. Few countries take into account the specific trade facilitation needs of small and medium-sized enterprises and women in business. To address this, SCAP is spearheading the development of an online course on next generation trade facilitation, specifically focusing on trade facilitation measures for SMEs, women, and for the agricultural sector. I hope these measures will become a priority for NTFTs in the future. In collaboration with UNCAS, we are also looking at how countries can reduce the impact of trade procedures and trade compliance mechanism on climate change and the environment. Early work points again to trade digitalization as a way to reduce waste and CO2 emissions from overly complex and paper intensive formalities. Our research shows that achieving paperless trade on a global scale could be equivalent to planting more than 1 billion trees. Looking ahead, it will be important to ensure that the progress made on trade digitalization and the acceptance of electronic documents during the crisis are secure. Strengthening of legal framework and implementing long-term digital and sustainable trade facilitation plans will help build resilience and enhance preparedness for future crises. Countries should continue and sustain efforts to strengthen cooperation to adapt to the increasingly digital global economy while leaving no one behind. I encourage all leaders to take advantage of all available global and regional mechanism to make progress such as WTA Trade Facilitation Agreement, as well as the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific, which is an enabling and forward-looking UN treaty that entered into force last year. I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to all our sister regional commissions for their collaboration on the global report and to UNCAS ICC, ADB, ASEAN, Oceania Customs Organization, CAREC Program, and so many other organizations and experts for the excellent cooperation during its preparation. I look forward to continued partnership to make trade simpler, cheaper, more resilient, and sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Executive Secretary, and uh, it's good that we also heard a bit about the results of the global, global survey on trade facilitation measures that you will be hearing a lot more uh, in the next couple of days. And also thank you so much for sharing experience from Asia and the Pacific. So let's now move to the customs, which is extremely important in trade facilitation. And we have the Secretary General of the World Customs Organization, Dr. Kunio, Mikuria to tell us uh, the progress in trade uh, NTFCs and customs operations, especially during COVID-19. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. The World Customs Organization is pleased to be part of this event and to contribute to the very important discussions on national trade facilitation committees. We have taken part in the past forums as well and are delighted to be joining hands with our partner organizations once again. Particularly, I would like to thank UNCTAD for their leadership in organizing this forum. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about severe disruption in international trade, which had a significant impact on the trade facilitation agenda overall. Two years into the pandemic, we are witnessing major disruptions in the global supply chain, which affect most of the economies worldwide and are attributed to various and complex factors. One of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is on cross-border e-commerce, where we experienced a tremendous growth in small and low value shipments, which has placed significant pressure on customer administrations. We are therefore investing efforts to support the members in implementing the WCO framework of standards on cross-border e-commerce. It covers areas such as the submission of advanced electronic data for efficient risk management and the establishment of trust-based partnership with e-commerce stakeholders to cater for the new business models. We are also investing efforts to ensure that the e-commerce framework of standards and the associated package of supporting tools are up to date and relevant. Trade facilitation plays a significant role in the recovery phase. Through simplifying and standardizing border procedures and creating transparent and predictable conditions for trade, customs administrations facilitate legitimate business that in turn increase economic growth and job opportunities. The trade facilitation agenda also encourages the customs community to play an important role in implementing the 2030 UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Custom can foster increased diversity and reduce inequality by helping open up opportunities for marginalized communities, including women entrepreneurs and small traders to access new markets while improving the conditions and ensuring safety at borders. We are fully aware of this important responsibility and now establishing the network of gender equality and diversity in the customs community as part of our efforts. Last year, we carried out a survey on NTFCs to take stock of the situation in this area, including the challenges and opportunities observed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on the result received, we published a secretary to note, which is publicly available on our website. What we have seen in that is many, many cases, the pandemic inevitably impacted the functioning of national trade facilitation committees. Many NTFCs have put their work on hold altogether due to the inability to meet in person. However, some, in some instances, NTFCs played an important role in addressing facilitation priorities during the pandemic and have benefited, benefited from the sense of urgency generated by this crisis. They highlighted better communication and cooperation between the public and the private sectors as one of the most important benefits. The WCO therefore strongly advocates for private sector involvement in the NTFCs for a constructive dialogue to strengthen partnership with the private sector. Their contribution to conducting the time release study, for example, is pertinent in identifying and addressing the bottlenecks at the borders. We also see their important role in advancing the work on custom business partnership of authorized economic operator programs that could pursue synergy with other public-private partnership arrangement by other government agencies. We also have to be particularly mindful of the small and medium-sized enterprises who are especially vulnerable and their specific needs need to be considered. The WCO's Regional Trade Facilitation Agreement workshops held in the past year discuss the role of TFA in ensuring not only swift cross-border movement of essential goods, but also in ensuring supply chain continuity. An important lesson coming out of these discussions 
was the need to strengthen the role of NPFCs, especially in implementing some of the most challenging provisions in the TFA, such as single window and border agency cooperation. Implementing the TFA through the standards and tools provided by the international standard setting community, including the WCO, can help tremendously in the recovery process. Another important change that the COVID-19 pandemic brought was the acceleration in digitalization and the more expensive use of electronic services in cross-border trade. Now we need to make sure to keep that momentum going and contribute to the paperless trade agenda. Here we see the importance of interoperability that supports single window solutions. During the WCO technology conference held online last November, we invited the heads of relevant public and private international organizations. They all stressed the importance of international standards in digitalization of the trade procedures and strongly supported the role of WCO data model in enabling interoperability. Digital technology produces many data, and as a result, collecting, sharing, and analyzing data has become a major prerequisite for customs performance. The WCO's theme of year 2022 was set as scaling up customs digital transformation by embracing a data culture and building a data ecosystem. We are currently developing the WCO data strategy to take advantage of the power of data that will empower customer administrations to apply innovation to their border procedures, contribute to evidence-based decisions, and foster an open data society. Therefore, it's, uh, 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 it is important that through its uh, Mercator program of capacity building, the WCO remains committed to the TFA agenda and stands ready to support its developing and least developed country members in trade facilitation implementation. Our support is extended to regional integration, including the most recent African Continental Free Trade Zone Initiative, as any regional integration efforts should be based on the TFA and other international standards, such as the WCO Revised Kyoto Convention to ensure connectivity at borders. This includes supporting stakeholder engagement and execution of forward-looking projects through the NTFC structure. I have confidence that the NTFC forums, such as the one held this week, will inspire cooperation, coordination, and collaboration amongst all parties in the NTFCs and will greatly contribute to the trade facilitation agenda in the short and long run. I wish everyone a successful global NTFC Forum 2022. Thank you very much for, to the SG of WCO for these insightful comments, and especially laying out uh, the next steps for NTFCs. And here I would like to emphasize the significant increases in cross-border e-commerce that you noted and uh, mentioned that the pressure on customs has been huge. And we believe that this will continue. And this is a trend that has begun during COVID-19, but it will not uh, go away. So very welcome the WCO guidelines in this, uh, in this regard. And this adds another task to the NTFCs. I think they need to take on this new challenge. So let me now uh, move to ITC. And we have Rajesh Agrawal, and uh, he's the acting director of the Division of Market Development at ITC. And uh, Rajesh, I think you have to put your hand up so that uh, the system can recognize you. So you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It is my pleasure to represent the International Trade Center today at the opening session of the Global Forum for NTFCs. I would like to thank UNCTAD for organizing this event, 
despite the challenging circumstances arising out of COVID-19 pandemic. We have had the privilege of collaborating with UNCTAD and UNECE in the past to organize such events. Today, after a gap of two years, during which the forum could not be organized because of unavoidable hindrances, we are again very pleased to collaborate with UNCTAD and contribute to this edition of the NTFC Global Forum. Forging collaboration, coordination, and partnership among trade actors is at the core of ITC's mandate and work. In the realm of trade facilitation, NTFCs play a unique role in fostering the spirit of collaboration and trust among public and private sector stakeholders responsible for or involved in trade facilitation reforms in their respective countries. ITC's support to strengthening NTFCs to promote trade facilitation reforms has intensified in the recent past as countries strive to build back their economies by promoting the ease of cross-border trade, which is seen as an important pillar of post-pandemic economic recovery. On this occasion, I would like to compliment the NTFCs for the tremendous progress made by them in bringing public and private sector stakeholders to the same table to jointly discuss trade facilitation reforms. It's a great achievement that all participants in this forum should be proud of. Second, NTFCs has enormously contributed to opening the trade facilitation policy space to active participation of the business community and by encouraging policymakers to listen to their perspective. Businesses have a vital role to play in NTFCs and it is of paramount importance that the private sector is involved at every step of the policymaking process from design to implementation and monitoring of trade facilitation reforms. Private sector's evidence-based advocacy, aided by practical experience of dealing with trade-related constraints, has stirred their respective governments to accelerate implementation of trade facilitation measures and even embark on an ambitious reform agenda, often going beyond the minimum requirements of WTO trade facilitation agreement. Private sector engagement has also been critical to the exercise of prioritizing and sequencing trade facilitation reforms with a view to maximizing the business benefit from optimal use of limited human and financial resources. NTFCs by enabling both the public and private sectors to be equal stakeholders in promoting trade facilitation reforms have sparked a truly collaborative approach in many countries which has been reflected in two major accomplishments. One, border regulatory agencies have worked together to overcome their hitherto zealously guarded turf issues in their national governance systems. Two, they have also experienced a far-reaching shift in the mindset from a silo approach of their respective work and standard operating procedures to a facilitative environment where border regulatory agencies align their individual practices to maximize the business impact of the reform measures. ITC has witnessed this change on the ground in its project implementation work undertaken with NTFCs on trade facilitation portals. Mapping and graphic depiction of dozens of steps and the complexity of many of these procedures to be gone through by businesses for import and export of even foodstuffs such as milk or wheat, astonished even the most seasoned border agency officials and made them realize the financial loss incurred by businesses due to high cost of navigating these avoidable complexities. The tryst with reality usually triggers NTFCs to take initiatives to simplify trade procedures at and behind the border through trade facilitation reforms. Going forward, ITC's support in implementing trade facilitation reforms is increasingly defined by imperatives of post-pandemic recovery. The use of digital technologies and user-friendly tools to foster simplification of procedures to reduce the time and cost of trading across borders is gaining ground. We are now supporting many NTFCs in driving simplification reforms 
by leveraging digital technologies. For example, from electronic transmission of certificates of origin to introducing online payment solutions and facilitating the adoption of virtual queue management systems at road border crossings. Second, we are promoting regional dimension of trade facilitation reforms to promote regional integration efforts, especially in Africa, pursuant to the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We have already supported the establishment of the first regional trade facilitation committee in West Africa, and we are now working with other regions to achieve the same result. A roadmap for regionally coordinated and harmonized implementation of trade facilitation reform measures for maximizing the trade integration effort has also been developed. Last, but of great importance, in difficult times of supply chain disruptions and major global challenges that will impact future generations, businesses in developing and the least developed countries have become conscious of the need for revolutionary reforms beyond the minimum implementation of the TFA mandated requirements. And we in the ITC are not only promoting this vision, but also helping the willing clients to implement such far reaching reform measures. One such initiative is focusing on whole of supply chain approach to trade facilitation reforms for addressing the entire spectrum of non-tariff measures, which can become barriers to trade. This means that trade facilitation principles and tools are being applied not only to customs clearance measures of revenue collection nature, but also to stringent regulations dealing with product quality or technical standards and sanitary phytosanitary standards, and even fast forward to environmental standards. We have provided support to many countries and regions, especially in East Africa, the Central European Free Trade Area, and the Central Asian region to resolve such trade obstacles using this holistic approach. To conclude, we must be able to demonstrate that trade facilitation reforms contribute substantially to achievement of SDGs. NTFCs have an increasingly important role to play in ensuring that trade facilitation reforms have a wide, long-term and far-reaching impact on societies and future generations, helping to achieve women's empowerment environmental protection and food security, among others. I'm confident that this forum will give all of us a solid base of information, inspiring examples, as well as opportunities to forge new partnerships and collaborations. Let's, let's commend this forum to record progress and reward success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rajesh, uh, and also for highlighting the work you do at ITC with NTFCs. And I think you made a very interesting and important point. You said that the, the, you have seen a mind shift away from turf issues towards much more collaboration that you have observed during this pandemic. And I hope that this issue will be taken up later in the forum as lessons learned and good practices as we emerge hopefully out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you so much. So now let me turn to OECD. Uh, we have Ms. Susan Stone. She's the head of the Emerging Policy Issues Division at the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of the OECD. And Susan has worked extensively in the area of trade policy in, 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 you know, in even in, in ESCAP too, where I knew her very well. So Susan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Shamika. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. It's a great pleasure for us to be here um, discussing what, uh, as all the previous speakers pointed out, is a really fundamental issue um, to leading to growth and, and sustainable development uh, for our economies. Um, I want to thank UNCTAD for organizing this event uh, because we really do believe in, in the importance of the National Trade Facilitation Committees and the key role that comes about from, from really good public-private partnership and stakeholder engagements. Um, as, as really COVID-19, um, as, as everyone has pointed out, COVID-19 has really 
um, brought and focused the minds. There's nothing like a crisis to focus the minds on what can be achieved through, through our collective efforts. While COVID-19 did increase and gave us a kind of new world of trade costs, including new border protocols, um, controls, documentation, it also uh, allowed for a number of, of innovation and, and really creative approaches to keep trade flowing. And trade facilitation played a major role in allowing goods and services to continue to flow and, and global value chains to continue to operate during really what was a, 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 a considerable um, disruption to the global economy. Uh, against this backdrop, there's kind of three key points I, I'd like to make um, for this discussion. Number one, um, how important it is for trade facilitation and the trade facilitation agreement in particular, along with the NTFC uh, in order to, to bring us out and, and ensure we have a robust recovery from COVID-19. Um, how TF reforms that have been implemented or introduced uh, were essential to a, having a, a sink us through the crisis, but are also essential in order to achieve an inclusive, sustainable and resilient recovery. And are really fundamental to the goals of the sustainable development agenda. And finally, um, how much TF matters in the digital age? And this was brought up by a number of speakers and we're, we're gonna reiterate one of those points as well as provide some evidence that we've developed here at the OECD. So first, um, how trade facilitation and the TFA was really a key role um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. As I noted, supply chains really continued to deliver goods throughout the different phases of the COVID-19 um, this crisis. And this was made uh, possible by TF measures that were taken at the border. The ongoing implementation of the TFA agreement really provided a basis for, for enabling these responses. And the OECD trade facilitation indicators highlighted especially the implementation and the, and the reforms made in emerging and, and developing economies the significant progress that was made on these fronts in automation and streamlining trade processes um, since the TFA came into enforce in 2017 were really essential in facilitating um, goods continuing to move. And this allowed um, different countries to really leverage digital technologies and ensure that border processes um, were transparent and accessible to traders because with all the confusion and all the, the different types of, of real-time information coming through, these, these transparent transparency and accessibility facilitation agreements and facilitating measures were really key across all global supply chains and across all economies um, in order that, that goods and processes could be expedited while at the same time um, lessening physical contact. Regions such as Europe, Central America, um, Central Asia, North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean really were shown specifically through our measures um, how they uh, exploited electronic lodging of documents in advance, um, acceptance of digital trade related documents in place of physical copies, electronic payments of trade related taxes, and digital certificates and signatures were especially important in these regions in order to keep things keep things flowing. And, and also we found that many governments enhanced their border co cooperation to address bottlenecks throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is important because, you know, key to this, to this forum and to this discussion about public-private partnership and, and working together, we found that this really having a whole of government approach and involving the private sector was, was key in many cases to going beyond existing um, structures for border agency cooperation. And this really had a big impact on enhancing capacity um, for governments to implement what was needed during COVID-19 crisis. And such structures as the National uh, Trade Facilitation Committees played a key role in this area. The second thing I kind of want to talk about was the 
the degree to which the trade facilitation agreement and trade facilitation in general is really crucial for implementation and a means of implementing the sustainable development goals agenda. First of all, for inclusiveness, we know that lowering trade costs uh, disproportionately benefits um, small firms. So therefore, uh, implementing the trade facilitation agreement allows uh, small startups and especially female entrepreneurs to grow and to move from the informal to the formal um, economy sector, which we know is important, is, is vital for them to become, to become viable businesses. OECD research using the trade facilitation indicators, as a matter of fact, shows that um, trade facilitation reforms help uh, micro and medium and small enterprises in developed and developing countries alike engage in more international trade. Even modest increases in trade facilitation um, show that MSMEs increase their probability of exporting by 3%. We also show that automation of border control processes, which are more inclusive to MSMEs in the consultation process and in their participation, um, also have a large differenti and differentiated impact and can help increase the value of MSMEs exports by up to six and a half percent. So there is there's really tangible evidence that these that these um, processes are important and have a direct impact and the vital input of the National Trade Facilitation Committees and other public-private partnership in achieving these kinds of results. Um, we also have found that these are important in, in enhancing the resilience of supply chains by boosting greater coordination, consultation and cooperation between governments and the private sector has a strong foundation and increases capacity to successfully navigate the process, the crisis, recover and absorb shocks and build collective responses. So not only are we in a better position to continue to fight the current situation, but we're in a good position to fight any other crises that uh, may loom on our horizon. The National Trade Facilitation um, Committees also play an important role in expanding the scope of coordination with the private sector stakeholders, as we all know. And this, of course, is vital in devising solutions um, which will stand the test of time and different pressures that increase um, as we move forward with even the continued supply constraints that we're seeing um, unfolding in the global economy. So the OECD um, has a toolkit uh, of um, resilient supply chains, which devises approaches for building trust in the global markets. And we do talk extensively about the importance of public and private action plans. And I would uh, encourage you to visit our website where we go into a lot of details on how this can, can play out. Um, we also see trade facilitation as being vital in terms of things like the circular economy, um, reversing and enabling ways that uh, it can underpin um, reverse supply chains and reverse uh, logistics across borders, as well as improve things like transparency, traceability of products and materials in a circular economy. Um, these are key to helping trade work to support uh, resource efficiency and a more sustainable economy. Um, finally, I just want to talk about, as many pick up on some of the uh, points made by previous speakers, in that uh, the trade facilitation and the national trade facilitation committees in the digital age, because we see this as them being even more important as opposed to less important as we move into digitalization. Um, the OECD is, is really showing that the trade facilitation agreement and such private partner, um, private public coordination is becoming more important. Trade facilitation, transparency, trade related regulation, streamlining border processes and enhancing border agency cooperation, especially in the area of the export of small parcels um, has been digitally enhancing these, can increase trade in these areas by between six and 14%. In the digital area, trade facilitation reforms um, though cannot be done in isolation. Digitalization of trade processes is needed at all stages of the supply chain. Everything from 
authentication, e-signatures, e-invoices, e-payments need to have the support of a growing number of physical and digital transactions. Um, and they need to have the greater interaction between public and private partnerships and also with the um, implementation of the trade facilitation agreement and the adoption of the institutional instruments for enable wider digitaliza digitalization of these trading processes. We also saw and was discussed there was a lot of reform, a lot of implementation, a lot of creativity put in place during the COVID-19 crisis on digital um, solutions to, to many problems. And we think it's important to lock in these reforms, to lock in these, these uh, transitions, especially in terms of ICT infrastructure at borders and also help with capacity building. Um, we think that international cooperation and technical assistance through mechanisms such as the aid for trade can really help address these issues. Um, we want to point out that since the start of Aid for Trade initiative in 2005, development cooperation providers have dispersed approximately $4.7 billion um, in US, U.S. dollars worth of aid in trade facilitation. But it's important to, that these measures are targeted to identify gaps and address challenges, especially in terms of recovery from COVID-19 and also resilience of any future crises. And of course, public-private partnerships are very important in these in all of these processes. So um, I just want to say again, we would like to emphasize the key role of public-private partnerships, including through such um, initiatives as the National uh, Trade Facilitation Coordination I mean, Committee. Sorry, in in recovering from the COVID nineteen pandemic and positioning countries to be able to deal with any future. Um, crises, the, the essential uh, element of TF reforms for an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economy because of the fundamental role they play in, in means of implementing the sustainable development goals, and finally, how TF matters more rather than less in the digital age. And just want to sum up by saying the OECD will continue to support open trade and transparency by providing research and databases on evidence-based tools, such as our trade facilitation indicators, the services restrictiveness trade index, and the digital trade regulatory inventory, which are all um, there to enhance uh, an inclusive um, and, and transparent and information availability for these important areas. Once again, uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, like to good, wish you all good luck for the rest of the forum and thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you so much also for highlighting some of the innovations and creative approaches that we have observed during COVID-19 times and you talk about digital tools and you also highlighted, I think this has been done by other speakers too, but I think this is something that we need to emphasize the importance of NTFCs in the process of recovery and the importance of the public-private partnerships. I think this is, this is key. I think these are coming as key messages during this opening. So now let me turn to um, the World Bank and invite Mr. Bill Gain, who is the Global Lead for Trade Facilitation Customs Reform and border management within the World Bank Group's MTI Global Practice to share his views with the forum. Bill, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, um, Director. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to, to everybody connected and particularly my fellow panelists. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here again and support the, the National Trade Facilitation Committee Forum. Firstly, I'd like to thank UNCAD for continuing to sponsor this forum. And the World Bank Group is very pleased to participate and co-host uh, together with UNCAD and our partner, Annex D Organizations, for this critical forum on National Trade Facilitation Committees. The COVID-19 crisis has further underlined the importance of trade facilitation and the efficient and coordinated border management for cross-border trade. 
disrupting billions of lives and livelihoods. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens decades of hard-won development gains and demands an exceptional response. National trade facilitation committees are one of the critical responses needed to facilitate implementation of active and sustainable reforms. Maintaining trade flows as much as possible has been crucial for ensuring the resilience in the supply chain as goods enter and leave countries, particularly vaccines, essential medical and humanitarian uh, products. Supporting safe working environments also has been critical in the face of the crisis, particularly during the early days. It has been absolutely essential for borders to maintain supply chains and the flow of goods. As we approach and move further towards the recovery phase, trade facilitation will become even more critical to ensure the effective and efficient distribution of vaccines and, and critical medical products. The Trade Facilitation Agreement provides very specific measures that assist countries and economies to implement specific reforms to facilitate the urgent cross-border trade of vaccine, medical goods, and emergency products. In response to COVID-19, the World Bank Group stepped up support to trade facilitation reform, including the establishment and sustainability of national trade facilitation committees in 30 or more countries. The World Bank Group is one of the largest multilateral providers of financial and technical assistance support for trade, and particularly trade facilitation and customs and border management reform. The World Bank Group trade facilitation support typically includes integration of a risk-based approach for border clearance processes, implementation, and more importantly, preparation for the implementation of automated systems, digitization, moving along the journey towards the full and effective implementation of national and regional single window systems. Often this has been through the World Bank Group's flagship program, the Trade Facilitation Support Program, and our national and regional financing instruments. Recent research by the World Bank Group has indicated the full and effective implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement will accrue $210 billion in savings to the private sector per year. As we've heard from other speakers, having a public-private dialogue mechanism at the national and regional levels is critical to ensure the private and public sectors partner together to lead the implementation of TFA reforms. In addition to strategies around cross-border trade at both the national and regional levels. One initiative we have found very, very useful is to develop a regional strategy in different regions for the implementation of all trade facilitation related activity. The success of national trade facilitation committees is dependent on many factors. I will uh, identify several for consideration during your deliberations this week. The first one, setting strategic priorities, ensuring effective decision-making and monitoring and evaluation of country progress is crucial for well-functioning NTFCs. The NTFC must take a whole of government approach to effectively include all relevant agencies, ministries, and stakeholders involved in trade. Further, broadening of the dialogue and capacity building for the private sector, including all relevant stakeholders, is important to the success of NTFCs and aids in increasing the compliance levels of trade reforms and compliance by traders. 
one issue that we have seen in some regions is a lack of capacity by the private sector to fully and effectively participate. Capacity building is often provided for ministries and government counterparts, but it is just important to ensure capacity building when needed is provided for the private sector stakeholders participating in this cr critical public-private dialogue mechanism. The actual creation of an NTFC can be challenging, but the real work is ensuring the committee is fully functional, sustainable, and has a work program to ensure stakeholders continue to provide the resources and motivation for this important leadership mechanism. This event over the next few days will provide a forum for you all to share your lessons of successes and challenges in this task. A further uh, important aspect to consider when establishing an NTFC is one of inclusiveness for women traders particularly. The World Bank Group recently launched work that helped identify specific obstacles and constraints in cross-border trade faced by women-owned, led, and managed firms related to border processes and procedures. This research showed that fewer women traders are regularly consulted compared to their men counterparts. And fewer women traders are represented in industry and trade associations and consequently NTFC structures. Addressing these gaps will be essential in assuring that all traders can benefit from trade reforms. I want to uh, reiterate a couple of points heard from previous speakers, and that is about the facilitating mechanisms around e-commerce and digitization. These will be not only critical, but absolutely essential in facilitating trade as we move to the recovery of COVID-19. What, in addition, I would like to draw your attention to bringing together trade facilitation and NTFC structures, not only at the national level, but looking at the benefits of supporting regional structures that can connect not only countries at the regional level, but institutions, ministries, public and private partners across borders. I'll leave my, my remarks there. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to make these remarks this morning. And I really wish you success in your deliberations. And I look forward to joining many of the sessions over the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And thank you also for highlighting the importance of NTFCs and N NTFCs that are functioning and that are functioning in a, in a more holistic, uh, whole of a, you know, with a whole of a government approach. I think this is an important message that we need to delve into again and again during the you know, next few days. So let me now turn to uh, the WTO. We have Ms. Annabel Gonzalez, uh, the WTO Deputy Director General since 2021. And I know that you all know is uh, Annabel from her previous, uh, you know, pre previous duties at the World Bank and the WTO, and also as the Minister of Foreign Trade of Costa Rica. So you are our last, but not, you know, one of the most important speakers. So please, you have the floor, Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shamika, for your kind introduction and for convening this very important uh, meeting. Uh, I am delighted to be uh, here uh, with all of you, uh, ladies, gentlemen, dear colleagues and, uh, and uh, friends. Um, so WTO members have moved uh, solidly 
into the implementation phase of the WTO trade facilitation agreement. And you, uh, the national committees, play a vital role in keeping the positive momentum going. Efforts to advance trade facilitation must be firmly rooted in the reality of trade in the future, not the past. The pandemic, new technological developments, geopolitical tensions, climate change, all are affecting what we trade, with whom we trade, and how we trade. So we must look at what a rapidly changing trade landscape means for the present and future of trade facilitation. Let me start with the present, which continues to be dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic and its unprecedented health and economic toll. The pandemic has vividly shown that trade facilitation and economic resilience are two sides of the same coin. Throughout the pandemic, trade facilitation has played a life-saving role in keeping trade in food and other essential supplies flowing. Trade facilitation enabled complex supply chains, some spanning as many as 19 countries, to be stitched together in record time to provide the specialized inputs and capital goods needed for the large-scale production of life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. We all this in no small measures to the adaptability of many border agencies. Under very difficult conditions, many of them took steps to facilitate trade from simplifying import declarations for essential goods to accepting scanned copies of certificates to conducted remote uh, inspections via video. This is commendable. It's the kind of flexible, pragmatic, and innovative thinking that is needed not only to respond to an unprecedented health and economic crisis, but also to build back better from it and to boost resilience to future emergencies. Turning to the future, this century is digital and trade facilitation will be at the heart of efforts to harness the potential of digital trade. E-commerce has opened the door to global trade for millions of small businesses all over the world, including many owned by women. And social distancing, lockdowns, and other measures adopted to combat the pandemic have led consumers to ramp up online shopping with global e-retail revenues projected to grow to 5.3 trillion US dollars in 2022. The opportunities are huge and so are the challenges. Take the so-called parcelization of trade. As the number of cross-border online B2C transaction increases, their average value is decreasing, generating more frequent international flows of lighter and cheaper parcels. That trend poses big challenges for border agencies whose clearance systems are often designed to tackle large container shipments, not small parcels. The increase in volume of shipments is sure to stretch border agencies around the world, especially in places where infrastructure is outdated and may heighten the risk of illicit trade in the absence of adequate controls. The Trade Facilitation Agreement is a powerful instrument to help meet the challenges and seize the opportunities of digital trade. It promotes closer consultation with supply chain participants and greater border agency cooperation with third countries. And it supports the use of risk management, post clearance audit and authorized operator programs, which can help customs and other border agencies to achieve better balance between their facility and security functions. The importance of these tools is especially apparent now when the movement of life-saving medical goods is extremely urgent, but allowing the importation of fraudulent goods can have deadly consequences. We must also pay greater attention to the contribution of new technologies to trade facilitation reform. Border agencies in many parts of the world are already experimenting with projects and proof of concepts involving blockchain, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and more. None of these are silver bullets, but with careful preparation, training, and the right enabling environment, they can help border agencies cope better with their expanded responsibilities and bring tangible improvements in many trade facilitation areas from single window interconnectivity to risk management to fight against smuggling. Before I conclude, let me say a few words about implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. Based on WTO notifications, developing countries have committed to implement over 74% of the TFA traditions uh, as of today. This is good news, and it owes much to the hard work and commitment of the NFTCs. You should be commended for it. But our job is far from done. 
LDCs are currently implemented the TFA at a rate of 41%. We need to do better. Development partners, international agencies, and NGOs must work alongside LDCs and each other to build capacity, improve connectivity, and strengthen trade-related infrastructure. As a member of your NFTC, your role in implementation and trade facilitation reform has become all the more vital. Through your leadership, you can encourage border agencies to formalize and build on the facilitating measures that were put in place during the pandemic. Your role to make sure that border agencies and stakeholders are collaborating and sharing information is essential in this rapidly changing environment. And you have an important role in making sure that all agencies are seeking and finding the implementation support they need from development partners, that they are on track to meet the implementation dates notified under the TFA, and if not, that requests for extension are filed accordingly to the agreement's deadlines. In conclusion, national committees will play an even more important role in the years ahead. In addition to your coordination and oversight roles, you can bring creative and strategic thinking to help your government, traders, and development partners meet the challenge of the 21st century and rip the economic benefits from full participation in the global trading system. So let's keep working together to ensure that trade facilitation becomes an even greater force for good now and in the years and decades to come. I count on your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annabel. Uh, for setting the stage for the rest of the forum. And I think it's very important that you highlighted that what a powerful tool trade facilitation agreement is in the recovery process. And it's good that you also reminded the forum of the implementation status of TFA and the countries that are in need of more support in capacity and connectivity and being creative in their NTFC structures. So thank you so much. And I think these are good words to, I guess, to end our uh, first session. So I don't think it's, I think it's gonna be an extremely difficult task to uh, uh, summarize all the insight that you have put on the table, but let me capture a few things so that, you know, we can start thinking of these uh, issues as we, you know, go to the next session. I think you all mentioned the, the highlight of the importance of dynamic and holistic NTFCs and especially in this pandemic recovery stage. And it was heartening to note that some of you are working on the ground, have already seen a mind shift away from prote protecting the turf towards a lot more private public partnerships and coordination across government agencies. These are all building on the relationships that have been established through NTFCs. And I think this is a, this is a good thing for us to take. Uh, you know, take forward. And I think every one of you talked about the importance of embracing digital tool and embracing e-commerce. I think all trade is going to be e-trade. So how important to embrace these new trends that are coming our way. And it is also uh, good to see, I think some of you even put out research out there to show there are a lot of opportunities in this emerging world for small, traders, for women traders uh, to benefit from lucrative international uh, trading uh, opportunities. So these are extremely important points. And I also want to uh, tell the, our participants from across the world, you must have heard all um, collaborators highlighted the work that they do on the ground and what kind of support they provide to the NTFCs so please, you know us, reach out to us when you are in need of uh, any sort of support. So this is not just an opening session, but it is also an information session for all of you out there across the world to hear what are the main international organizations are doing on the ground in supporting trade facilitation efforts, and especially the efforts of NTFCs. So having said that, so let me now give the floor back to Paul. Paul, please. Thank you very much, Yamika. And thank you very much to all the high level uh, panelists. I think we had a very interesting kickoff of our forum 2022. 
Um, so we are prepared for the following sessions. Um, before ending this session, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, we had a drawing artist uh, also with us. So I would like to show you how he has captured this opening session. So if we can uh, please get the drawing on the screen so all the participants can uh, see this and see the complexity and the multitude of issues that have been uh, highlighted during this opening session. Is it possible to get this drawing on the screen? Here we are. So you will see that our moderator and our speakers are on the left-hand side and uh, the complexity of trade facilitation and the issues that the national trade facilitation committees have to work with and the environment that they have to work on are well illustrated here. We will be sure also to share these uh, drawings uh, on our forum website so you can uh, download it from there and you can capture these issues. So this was one of the issues I mentioned initially. initially. The other issue I mentioned initially was that we are going to uh, make short or uh, small polls during the uh, forum. And I would like if we could illustrate the uh, first poll that we have done during this session, if we can get that on the screen, there were two uh, questions uh, in there. Uh, one question regarding the uh, if you are members of the NTFC or not, and the other question if you were uh, part of the public or the private sector. Is it possible that we can get the poll result on the screen? If not, I can uh, mention here what the results were. So are you a member of the NT or an NTFC, a National Trade Facilitation Committee? Um, we have around 500 attendees locked on to this opening session. 57% uh, are saying, yes, they are members of the NTFC. 43% are saying no. Uh, the second question is, are you from the public sector or the private sector or other? And here we have 68% from the public sector, 15% from the private sector, and 17% from other. Uh, so these are important results. And, and, and one of the uh, result or one of the outcomes of, of this poll, I think that are important is that uh, the split between public and private sector representatives uh, is quite a lot in favor of public sector. I think we need to work with the private sector to engage private sector representatives to participate in these fora. It is important for them and it is important for the public sector to understand the requirements from the private sector. So we will certainly uh, redouble our efforts in this sense. This brings to the end the opening high level session of uh, this forum for NTFCs 2022. We will continue in about two hours. The next session starts at 2 p.m. GMT, and you can log on via the same link as you have logged on uh, now. We look forward to see you there and to have even more participants in the following session. And from there, we will continue over the next three days as well with interesting sessions that can bring you uh, food for thought in your work with National Trade Facilitation Committees. Thank you so much for now, and uh, we will be back in a couple of hours. Thank you.